Um, this morning uh, in our somatic movement and anatomy class, we'll be doing class two of standing and walking. And we'll be, we won't be on the floor this morning. We'll go back to that next month. We're gonna be in our chair. We're gonna stand, we're gonna walk. We're gonna come back to the chair. We're gonna go back and forth between chair, standing and walking. I won't have you standing and walking for long periods of time at one time at all. Um, because I don't really like that either. <laughs> and I'm in a fairly small space and I know a lot of you are, so we're gonna do the best we can in the space we have. So you'll need a chair. It's best not to have a swivel chair, although you'll have what you have and we'll work with it. Cause some of the things that apply to standing alignment apply to sitting alignment. And so we'll do a few things in sitting as well. Um, and it take off your shoes, you can leave your socks on or not, but because we're gonna be standing and walking, we wanna be able to feel our feet and the bottoms of our feet have so many sensory receptors to help the brain organize uprightness and movement. Um, so we're gonna start with some slides. So let me go to screen share. <clears throat> Click here. And I've got to adjust this and I have to minimize this. Okay, let's see if I can. There we go, I think I can do that. Okay, so um, I love this picture. This is Thich Nhat Hanh. What we think we become, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, uh, soma, our living experience. I use the word soma a few times in the in the, uh, in the class today, uh, some people just say body, but soma is bigger than body because it's our whole living experience as we're living it. And it includes body, mind, and spirit. So we're gonna look at a few pictures. Um, our goal for the class is to refresh and improve our gait for easy, comfortable walking. Let me see if I can even minimize that more. There we go. And um, just showing some happy people out for their walk. And that's what we all need to remember to do. And I love this little, this little kid, he's so happy. He's just out there in his little galoshes playing around and um, just having a good time with his body. That means he's deep in the parasympathetic nervous system and is just taking it all in. I really like the picture of this man, even though he's got a cane and he's stooped over, he's got a pretty straight back rather than a real curled spine. And he looks like he's out there chugging along and having a good time. And he's not letting his, whatever his impairments are, stop him. And I, to me, he looks very vital. So I, I really liked this picture in spite of, we can point out this or that. I also like that his front leg, which is his heel is now touching the ground. His front leg has straightened instead of uh, uh, keeping a bent knee. Okay, adjusting, thank you, Isaiah. And um, you can even see in his back leg, he's approaching the toe off. So he's got good form in spite of uh, being more uh, leaned forward. And then uh, here's a woman, she looks happy and alive. She's using the walking sticks. Uh, one of our students, uh, Jackie, uh, talked about that in the last class. She's really enjoying walking more since she's used the walking sticks. I haven't used walking sticks, but a lot, they're very popular. The, one of the main things to remember is that walking is full body and synergistic, the whole body working together. Synergistic is, synergism is working, all working as a whole. Walking isn't about parts, it's about the whole. Um, I, always, I like this picture, I've shown it before, and even though it's dancing, not walking, it's just full of life, full of ease, Bodies in motion, a lot of rhythm in this. Walking is actually a rhythmic move most of the time if we're, if we're walking to just walk and enjoy ourselves. And um, lots of balance, lots of coordination, lots of joy. 
and it just oozes joy. And we need to exude that when we, when we need to get into that place, I think more when we walk rather than I've got to walk because I have to exercise and it's good for me. That's great. But we also want to like, and I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to feel alive and I'm going to breathe. And then walking today becomes very problematic, uh, constantly on our devices, not paying attention. And also uh, the, the forward head, uh, not very expressive legs. Now he's on his device. Maybe he's not on his device all the time, but we see this a lot. And this is, this is not aliveness walking. And even in these young kids walking to school, um, you can already see in this uh, girl, her rounded shoulders, people, uh, young people carrying heavy backpacks. You can almost begin to see the shoulders rounding. You can really see it in her. And you also can see, it, it seems to me, you can start to see a compression through her body. Now, even though this kid has his, his or her, I'm not sure if it's a boy or a girl, eyes are down. He's, you can st st still see his back is fairly straight. She's starting to already have a curve and a compression, a, a squeezing through her trunk. Anyway, um, we're going to uh, now get a little bit more active and we're going to move into some standing alignment. This is to refresh us and renew our standing alignment. Uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to stop screen sharing in a moment and I'm going to do this with you. And I've, uh, I've, um, copied this sheet on a piece of paper so that after I come off of screen share, I can still read the various points. But let's just go through it briefly and do, and we can apply a number of these things for standing alignment in sitting alignment. So even though we're not gonna stand right this second, we're gonna sit. And when we sit, we can still feel our verticality between the crown of our head um, uh, the uvula is that thing that extends down in the back of your throat, the center of your pelvic floor. And we will have some weight on our feet, but our weight are, is on our sits bones. And uh, when we stand, we want to make sure our knees are unlocked. When we're sitting, we want to make sure that our ankles are under our knees. We're sitting comfortably. Um, if you Bring your feet back under your chair. You're strongly contracting your hamstring muscles. So it's best to have right angles at the knee so that the feet can come down. And they're part of your support system, although your sits bones in sitting are much more important. And uh, you want to uh, center your weight uh, when you're sitting over your sits bones. And you can just move your body, lean it a little forward and backward, going out of balance on purpose so that then you can come back to center. Sometimes when you're not sure if you're centered, you go out of balance forward and back, you can go in other directions and that helps you to come back to a more centered position. Eyes on the horizon. Eyes on the horizon is the default position for the eyes. You totally want to be able to look around and notice things. You want your head and neck to be free, your eyes to be free. But then you want to be able to come back, default position, and have your eyes find the horizon. Our tailbone, our coccyx hangs down, our sacrum drops. We don't, in sitting and standing, we don't want to tuck, that's the curl, and we don't want to overarch. We want to be in a very easy neutral, and the key is tailbone down. And again, if you're not sure, you can uh, inhale and do a gentle arch. You can exhale, do a gentle curl or tucking. And again, you can go back and forth a little bit getting smaller and smaller with your arch and curl, finding your weightedness and centered over your sits bones. You want to relax your face and jaw. And we and from polyvagal theory with Stephen Porges, um, 
he recommends when you can smile, find some joy and smile. Smiling really affects, believe it or not, your parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which is the calming part of your nervous system mechanics. The parasympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system balances the sympathetic active part. And it balances it in much more nuanced ways than we have understood, than we have previously understood before the polyvagal theory that Stephen Porges has really um, illuminated. Smiling has this incredibly internally physiological effect to uh, put out positive hormones and all kinds of um, uh, vagus nerve um, neutralizing aspects so that we can remain calm and not be in stress. So now I'm gonna come out of screen share. I'm gonna adjust my screen so that I think you'll see most of me, Isaiah will help if I have it. And we're gonna to come to standing and, oh, that's good. We're gonna to come to standing and I'm gonna go back through this. So before you walk, you have to stand. So every once in a while, uh, it's good to notice you're standing. And there are times that we are standing in a line somewhere more and more sometimes with the COVID and waiting in line for things. And it's good to check our, our standing posture. So we want to uh, stand and feel our verticality. Again, crown, uvula, that extension in the back of the throat. If you don't know the uvula, just forget about that. The center of your pelvic floor. And then you want to feel that you're centered between your legs and your weight is centered between your feet. You want to be sure and unlock your knees. Now, um, but I think if I take off, somehow I feel like if I take off my sweater, it'll even be a little better. Um, I, uh, I'm, I wanna thank Mary for emphasizing that in her classes, perhaps other people are too. But when our knees are locked, we're pushing our knees backward. Very, very bad habit for posture and movement in general. Because if you just gently do this, when you push your knees back, it locks your pelvis. It really contracts your lower back. So let go, do a soft bend, just a little bend and come to a soft straight. If you can reach, put your hands to your lower back and now push your knees back and feel how contracted and stiff you get in the low back and in your pelvis and in your pelvis. So unlock a small bend to soft straight, very important to practice. And if you are, if you hyperextend your knees, if you're a knee locker, you wanna practice this all the time and try to release that habit because that's gonna, that's gonna imbalance your body constantly. And now you wanna balance your body constantly by coming out. Um, <clears throat> center weight distribution on your feet. You can always, like we did in the chair, you can go a little forward towards the balls of your feet. You can come a little backward. You might also notice like it's easier for me. I go farther when I go forward. I go less far when I go back. You may notice difference, but the idea of going out of balance is that then you can find balance. And I like to unlock my knees again in case I lock them. Again, eyes on the horizon, that's your default position for your eyes. You want your eyes to know where the horizon is. So you're walking or you're in line, you're looking around, that's great. And then learn to come back to the horizon. Remember, if you are, if your default position, which is actually my pattern more to look up, then I am contracting the back of my neck constantly. So I needed to learn and I still need to practice that when I go into my default posture, I go, oh, I am actually looking up. I'm not on the horizon. You have to kind of find the horizon. And it's not that easy if your default uh, eyes, if your default position for your eyes is to either look up or to look down. And if you, the default position for horizon, if you bring your fingers right under your nostrils, 
and come back, they go into your ear holes. That's approximately horizon. And sometimes you're not sure where you are and you can bring your fingers from right below your nostrils back into your ear holes and that might help you find horizon. Your tailbone, your coccyx is hanging down, your sacrum drops, no tucking, no overarching. No tucking, no overarching. <clears throat> A lot of people have learned they're supposed to tuck because they say, oh, well, if I tuck my back lengthens, but now it completely throws your posture off. You want neutral, you want your tailbone to be down, you want your sacrum to drop, you don't want any over tucking or over arching. Relax your face and jaw. And if you can, find some joy, smile, and increase the good hormones running throughout your body. Okay, let me go back into screen share and go to the next slide. Okay, so. And we're here. Okay, so now when we do, I just wanna say when we do standing alignment, we're looking for improvement. Um, <clears throat> let's start with these pictures. So here's a man that's undergone some alignment training and you can see uh, in this picture, they've drawn at certain points. These are classical points center of the ear, center of the shoulder, center of the hip, center of the knee, slightly in front of the ankle, <clears throat> that where he was earlier, and now he's quite a bit straighter. You're not looking for perfection, you're looking for improvement, and improvement over time so that you can really <clears throat> start to sense and become aware of where you are. And this is a chart, this is from Egoscu, he's a famous, a uh, person who works with a lot of people. He's really helped a lot of people and he works with posture and movement and exercise. Okay, let's go to walking. Um, I'm going to, we're gonna go right into walking. I'm going to um, stop the screen share. And again, I have made a, um, I have made a copy of this so I can read it as we go along. And I just wanna point out in this picture, this is contralaterality. Here's an opposite back arm and an opposite back leg. Here's an opposite forward arm and an opposite forward leg. That's what contralateral patterning is. So let me come out of this. And again, I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm Isaiah, maybe help with this. And maybe a little bit more so you can see my head. If you push the computer back just a little bit, yeah, like that. Good, yeah. Okay, so I don't have much room, but I'm gonna do the best I can. You know, one of my favorite um, aspects of walking is walk with dignity. If, you, if inter your internal self-talk and your internal state really helps you position your body. So if you think about walking with dignity, it helps you to stay upright. It helps you to lengthen. And it and so you want to, so one of the phrases you can use is walk with dignity. Of course, we always need to adjust our stride for comfort, safety, and our circumstance. You want to feel contralaterality. So Let's just do this movement in standing. Let's start with the upper trunk. Don't worry if the lower trunk comes along or not, but you're going to just gently rotate your rib cage and your head and neck to one side and come back to center and rotate to the other side. Please be comfortable, not too fast, not too slow, just to feel it's more of a what we call a means whereby, where you're discovering what it feels like to rotate or turn. So that's upper body. Now we're gonna stay with upper body. Notice when I swing an arm one arm forward and one arm back, it brings my rib cage into rotation. My forward arm helps to turn my rib cage to the opposite direction. 
My backward arm helps to turn my rib cage in the same direction. And so if you just put on a swing and it helps your rib cage and you can do different things with your head, but your arm swing and your rib cage rotation, your rib cage rotation and your arm swing go together. Now for feeling the contralaterality in the pelvic girdle, I, I, I don't know if you can see me. If I'm, what I'm doing is I'm putting my hands on my pelvis to feel it. And I'm, I'm, it doesn't matter that I'm turning my upper body right now. The point is I'm gonna, here's my right side. I'm turning my right pelvis to the left. So I'm bending my right knee a little bit and my, my left leg is kind of coming back just a little bit. And then I'm gonna switch. And I just wanna feel internally that I can rotate my pelvis. And it's easier right now for my whole body to rotate. But now let's see if we can go into contralaterality. So I'm going to turn my upper body in and my pelvis in opposite directions. Take your time. We're just doing this as a movement exercise. Your rib cage and pelvis are moving in opposite directions. Your arm swing is helping your rib cage turn. Your leg position is helping your pelvis turn. And your somatic center is negotiating that change. That's a nice one to practice a little bit. We'll stop there because of time. You want to feel, uh, go on to the next one, you want to feel your back leg as the propulsive leg. So here's my back leg and I'm going to go into toe off. When I go into toe off, my gluteal muscles on that side contract. My, my leg is straight behind me and I'm, I'm towing off. And what that does is it erects me. It not only propulses me forward, my back leg propulses me forward, but it erects me, it, it makes me lengthen. And so uh, one exercise I like to do is to put my hands on my gluteal muscles and I like to feel my back leg being my propulsive leg. And as I'm just able to take a few steps in the space I have, as I feel that toe off, those gluteal muscles relax. Of course, they take turns, then they get to turn off when, when the leg goes forward. But you want to be, you, you don't want sleepy glutes. You don't want over contracted glutes all the time, but there's an appropriate time with toe off with the propulsive leg, you want those glutes to be able to fire. And that's going to propel you forward. And it's going to erect you upward. Very important for uh, walking for the walking for a comfortable, healthy walking gait. Okay, again, your tail hangs down, your sacrum drops, no extra tucking or arching. Now, go ahead and tuck your pelvis, do a little bit of a curl, tuck your pelvis and walk. You can't get a propulsion. When you're tucked, you, your, your back leg is out of commission. A lot of people that tuck and are curled when they walk, they lose tone in their uh, gluteal region. Their glutes aren't contracting and they can't get a toe up. They can't get a propulsion. So in order to go forward, they have to pull pull their body forward instead of the back leg propulsing the body forward. So tucking is you don't want to tuck and you don't want to over arch and keep your back contracted all the time, all the whole back. Um, again, you're, we talked about this already, eyes, head and neck, the eyes on the horizon and that will make your neck nice and long front and back and sides. You want to look around with ease and then you want to be able to find the horizon again, fingers under the nostrils to the ear holes. You want to open up your peripheral vision to the side and below you. Um, it will help you feel bigger 
it'll help you to feel more upright and it's actually safer because then you're taking in your environment. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that and expand that later on. And then the last one I have is Lottie Da Walk. Integrate your walking in a relaxed manner. Contralaterality, your arms are swinging. I don't have too much room here to really do a big propulsion, but I can still feel even in this small space, I'm still triggering my glutes with my propulsive leg and I'm getting toe off. So those are our opening guidelines for walking. And we'll come back to that. Hopefully we'll have time at the end of class. In fact, would you tell me when it's nine o'clock? Okay. And we'll come back. Okay, so let's move on. And I'm going to um, uh, go back to screen share. And we're going, I'm going to do a little anatomy section now for a few slides, although we will do a few movements. Um, we're going to talk about the balance between mobility and stability, Mo stability, mobility, balance. Uh, our goal is to allow stability throughout the whole system, the whole soma, the whole body, while maintaining mobility, that is moving with flexibility and adaptability. So most people don't even realize we have a stabilization system and a movement system. We've got two very distinct kinds of muscles and sometimes muscles play different roles, but we have a local stabilizing muscle system and we have a global range of motion, ROM, range of motion muscle system. Every activity, and activity is a movement, every activity movement requires a balance of stability, which is support, stability, support, and mobility, movement. So we're going to look at this. M many people don't realize we have anything called a stabilization system. So we're going to start over here. Local muscles should fire first and support, stabilize the joints. For example, the spinal joint facets. So here's our spine. Here's our spinous processes that stick out in the back. Transverse processes, transverse processes, transverse, transverse, tra transverse, 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 transverse. Here's the facet joints. The facet joints on each side is how one vertebrae locks in to the next vertebrae. We have little muscles in many places local to connecting one vertebrae to another and even parts of a vertebrae to itself. These are called local stabilizing muscles and they include the multifidus this is a group of many, many, many muscles, one on top of the other, on top of the other, under this semispinalis, all the way up, especially the multifidus in the lumbar area because the lumbar area is, area is the center of the body, but all the way up the spine, the multifidus and these other very smaller muscles, which have different names. Here's, here's a multifidus right here where they're just showing you one strand of this whole group of multifidus muscles. These are called local stabilizing muscles. Local stabilizing muscles should work automatically and reflexively. When these muscles contract, they position and support joints. They are not the muscles that gives, give us range of motion. These muscles need, these local muscles need to fire first so they protect support, uh, protect support and stabilize joints so that when our larger muscles move, our joints are protected. How to enhance the stability function? Create a motor plan. 
This prepares our local muscles for pre-movement. So a motor plan. Some people say visualize the movement you're going to do. Some people aren't good visualizers, but you can, especially if you're going to be lifting something heavy, especially if you're going to be carrying something, especially if you're recovering from injury or in a rehabilitation program because of an injury. It becomes more important to be more thoughtful about your movement. And so just thinking about what you're going to do. Okay, now I'm preparing myself to stand. Now I'm preparing myself to walk. Now I'm preparing myself to lift something out of the boot of my car. This preparing gives your brain time to organize these local stabilizing muscles. And um, it, it's often called pre-movement. It's like in the spinal cord is where agonist antagonist relationships with muscles are set up. The brain is doing it before you actually bend your elbow to work your biceps. Your brain has already organized your triceps, the opposite muscle to be able to not contract so it can lengthen in relationship to your biceps contracting. So pre-movement becomes very important, especially if our bodies are more fragile for some reason, especially pain. So we want, how do we do that? Well, we think about it, that's creating a motor plan. Uh, practice moving slowly into contraction. Uh, um, I'll come off screen in just a moment and we'll practice this together. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Focus your awareness on the sensations of the movement you're doing. Become, focus your sensations internally. I love this quote by Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. Awareness is a motor act. <laughs> I so agree with that. Um, so, even in a chair, let's say I'm going to prepare myself to uh, erect myself, to lengthen myself, okay? So I'm feeling my sits bones and this is very small, very internal because I want to really focus in on my stabilizing muscles. Maybe I can feel them, maybe I can't, it doesn't matter, but if very slowly, I think you can see this, I'm talking about under a quarter of an inch, maybe more like a 16th of an inch. If I, if I prepare and then slightly erect myself and relax, can you see that? Very slightly, just slightly, go ahead, erect yourself very slightly and then slowly let yourself relax. If you are recovering from injury and all our muscles, all our joints have stabilizing um, muscles and uh, fascial muscle ligament and tendinous aspects to them that are part of the stabilizing system. We're, we're gonna stick with the spine today. But when you go into, if you're not sure about a movement, if you're recovering from a shoulder or a spinal injury, anywhere, a hip injury, when you come to movements like you're doing your floor daily cat movements, when you come to those movements, start those movements very slowly. And a few times, just go into the movement a little bit and come out. Then if you wanna continue to arch, so I'm gonna go into erection, I'm gonna erect myself, I'm gonna erect myself, and now I can carry on a bigger movement because I've allowed those stabilizing muscles, sometimes the brain, sometimes to work with those stabilizing muscles. It's like with a shoulder that you're recovering from. A lot of people, when they're recovering from shoulder injury, they're uncomfortable and they raise their shoulder to bring their arm up instead of trying to figure out how to keep their shoulder down and let their scapula go slightly down as they raise their arm up. So if you are working with, for example, a shoulder injury, think about, okay, the motor plan is that you wanna raise your arm, but you wanna go into it slowly. And if you know a little bit about your anatomy and joints, you wanna keep that shoulder down and you just barely begin to raise your arm and you come back down. 
and you let your brain find what it needs to support the shoulder girdle, to support that joint. And then you can go into and work with your longer muscles. So learning to work, learning to, especially if you are recovering from something or have pain, you want to learn to work with your stabilizing system. Let me go back to screen share. I don't know why it's doing that, but it's, it's okay. So, so here's our stabilizing system. And then we have what's called a global muscle system. So what happen, your global muscles are your more superficial, longer muscles. Erector spinae are global muscles, not stabilizing muscles. So global muscles should fire after local muscles. Local muscles first to support the joint, to stabilize the joint, to support the joint, to position the joint. Then global muscles give us our ranges of motion. They are more superficial, longer, and often cross more than one joint. These are the muscles we usually study in anatomy classes. These are emphasized in exercise programs. We have more voluntary control over global muscles. We don't have much, um, we don't have much voluntary control, if any. We, some, we can learn the skill of, of going very slowly into a movement and, and getting into our stabilizing muscles. But in general, that's not what we think about. If you make a motor plan about what you're going to do, your brain will start activating these and firing these um, stabilizing muscles. And then you do your movement. Um, when global muscles, so we have more voluntary control over global muscles. When global muscles are overworked in life and in workouts and local muscles are neglected, global muscles must take over the function of stabilizing joints and they usually become chronically tight, contracted and short. Many clients, many people will say, my back is always tight, my back is always contracted, or some part of them is always tight and contracted. It may be that they need to back up and work very, very small movements, slow, small, getting the stabilizing system in place so that they can stop having their global muscles act, at, act to stabilize their, their joints. It's a, very, it's a very interesting balance between stability and mobility. And then we have, I know time is going on. Then we have um, people always talking about stability and core. What is the core? What is our core? Uh, well, the core is many things to many people. Um, different people have different opinions about what the core is. Almost every form, exercise program and form of body work has its definition of core. I love Feldenkrais's definition. Feldenkrais said the core was our nervous system. I really like that one a lot. Most, however, most anatomists and um, exercise people include at minimum what is called the transversus system the transversus system. And that, in, that includes the TA, transverse abdominis, the multifidus, and some include the internal oblique. So we, we're gonna look at some pictures, but let me just follow through on the, on the words and then we'll come back. In HANA somatic education, we identify the somatic center, somatic center between rib cage and pelvis as the center of movement. The somatic center spans deep, to superficial. And we don't often talk, I think, enough about stabilizing, mobilizing sta the stability mobility system. But our, uh, at least theoretically, the somatic center is three dimensional through the whole body. Remember, core stability is a whole body function, not just a core function in isolation. The function of stability is about staying in balance so your body can move and act in the world with ease and safety. So the transversus system is, here's the transverse abdominus in yellow, and it's very transverse in its uh, muscle fibers. 
This is your internal oblique. It's below your rectus abdominis. It's below your external oblique. And the internal oblique is a little bit on top of the transverse abdominis. And then the transversus system also includes the multifidus. So we have this around the center of our body, we have this core of muscles, multifidus for the spine, the transverse abdominus, like a girdle all the way around our body and the internal oblique. Um, and we're going to look at a, another aspect of it literally from the, that, that attaches into the midline and it goes all the way around to the back. And we're going to look a little bit more at that, in fact, um, with the next slide. And then we're going to get into movement again. But I think it's very important to begin to use the anatomy to get an understanding of this mo uh, 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 stability mobility system. So we're going to look at this piece of fascia right here. It's called the thoracolumbar lumbar aponeurosis. It's a large flat tendon. It's many layers thick. And we have an abdominal aponeurosis, and it's many layers thick. And this one covers the whole front of our body, or from our nipple line all the way down to our pubic bone. And this thoracolumbar lumbar aponeurosis attaches thorax, thoraco, lumbar, the lumbar area, with our uh, uh, pelvis and sacrum. And these two pieces of fascia, very thick, many layers are extremely important. Uh, the thoracolumbar fascia connects the thorax and the lumbar spine of the sacrum and pelvis. It keeps our arm and leg movements coordinated and organized in relationship to our spine, our core and our trunk. At a superficial level, Notice lats, latissimus dorsi to opposite gluteus maximus, shoulder to opposite hip. Here's the latissimus dorsi. It ties in not only to the spine by its tendon, it ties into this huge piece of fascia. It's tying into the superficial layer of the thoracolumbar lumbar aponeurosis. And it actually, the latissimus dorsi comes from the front of the arm right near the pectoralis major. Pectoralis major ties into the arm, lats is right next to it. So we have a relationship that's kept in balance from our shoulder arm, diagonally across our body, contralateral organization as in walking, through our gluteus maximus, into our hip, down our leg. So our arm, our opposite arm and leg are very much kept in relationship to each other, not just muscularly, but through this huge fascial connection, which is very important to its uh, coordination and its organization. So um, let's just come back to this. Transversus system attaches to the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia. So this multifidus, you can't see it here, they didn't draw it in, but this layer, deep layer of the multifidus also attaches to a deep layer of this thoracolumbar lumbar aponeurosis. So this piece of fascia goes from superficial to deep. And this piece of fascia goes from superficial to deep, keeping the different muscular layers in relationship to each other. The, um, when we look at this front piece of fascia, we can see, let's come back to this picture, the transverse abdominus and the internal oblique both attach to the back thoracal lumbar fascia and to the front abdominal aponeurosis a very important part of stability, mobility, organization. And then we can compare the abdominal fascia in the front with the thoracal lumbar fascia in back. It also has many layers from superficial to deep. The pectoralis major attaches into it. 
the rectus abdominis attaches into it. Both the, here's the external oblique, underneath is the internal oblique. Both the internal and external obliques attach to the uh, abdominal aponeurosis. Um, and, um, and the transverse abdominis and the transverse abdominis attaches to it at its very deepest layer. Notice how it keeps our arm and pelvic movements coordinated and organized in relationship to our spine, core, and trunk, and in the front diagonal. So we have this front diagonal kept in relationship to each other, and we have this back diagonal kept in relationship to each other. Okay. Let's just move, uh, uh, and now we're going to come a little, now we're gonna come into uh, some movement. Uh, we're going to be doing um, a movement, we're gonna stand in just a moment and do a movement through our feet. This is a figure eight movement, and one of our students, Lisa Sachs, reminded me of this movement a couple of classes ago, and she attributed it to Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. I've done it several times with different teachers, and I believe that Bonnie probably originally made it up because she's such a genius, but I don't exactly know who to attribute this movement to. So this movement is so good because we're gonna be on our feet and the feet are such an important part of our stability system, our uh, balanced vestibular system. The feet have many, 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 many sensory uh, receptors in them so that the brain knows where our feet are and where our support is, whether we're on both feet or one foot or our feet in different positions because of the activities we're doing. So we're gonna now tune up pre-movement reflexes and small local stabilizing muscles in preparation for walking and upright activities. A reflex is a response to a stimulus without conscious thought. It, the, an example is the writing reflex. This is the reflex that helps to keep us upright. If we begin to fall, our writing reflex kicks in and it kicks in from our feet, it kicks in from our vestibular system, it probably kicks in from our eyes, it kicks in from our stability system in our spine. It's a very, it's very, very interesting, this writing reflex. And we have many reflexes. Reflexes are a brain stem function, basic function to support um, our upright posture and movement. The soles of our feet have many, many sensory receptors and are part of our balanced vestibular and orienting in space system. Our brain keeps track of where, uh, where our top, head, neck, eyes, and bottom feet are in order to keep us upright and balanced. Okay, so here's, I'm, I'm gonna just show you what this exercise consists of, then I'm gonna come out and I'll do it with you. Um, I'm calling this foot one, and I'm gonna start on my right foot. It doesn't matter which foot you start on. We're gonna go from, uh, we're gonna make a figure eight. We're gonna go from, both, both feet will move. We're gonna go from the heel up the lateral side of the foot across the transverse arch, across to the other foot, down the medial foot of foot two around the heel up the lateral side of foot two, across the transverse arch, back to our first foot, down the medial foot, and we're gonna make a figure eight. I'll do this with you. I'll call it out a few times, and then I'll let you just practice it. So let me come out of screen share. And uh, they need to see me, especially my feet, but my whole body is good. Now, these are small, good, these a little more on my feet. Yeah, thank you. These are small movements. So they're a combination of reflex movements and stabilizing, local stabilizing muscle movements. So I'm gonna start with my right leg. I'm gonna focus on my right heel and I'm going to come from my right heel up the lateral side. Whoops, there's something interfering with the screen. How can this be taken away? I, I'm sorry, let me see if that can be taken away. Okay, maybe if I bring this over here, okay. Okay, 
uh, starting on the right heel, coming up the lateral foot, across the transverse arch of my right foot to my left foot, down my medial foot, around my heel, up the lateral side of foot two, across the transverse arch to foot one, down the medial foot, around the heel, up the lateral side of foot one, across the transverse arch to foot two, down the medial foot of foot two, around the heel, up the lateral side of foot two, across the transverse arch, down the medial side. See if you can carry on on your own. You can feel that these are small movements and they're helping the brain to organize uh, re uh, reflex preparation and small stabilizing muscles to prepare us and to tone up, to refresh reflex patterns. Oops, I just messed up. Reflex patterns so that they're in play as we do all of our movements, including walking. This is a really nice exercise to do and get in the rhythm of because this will tune up writing reflexes and um, uh, other, other reflexes that will help us to have our brain make sure it moves into the uh, reflex and local muscle stabilizing system. So I hope you all practice that periodically. Oh, well, actually, just stand now for a moment and walk around a little after doing that and see if you feel, I know I'm in a very small state, but I can feel, first of all, I'm very aware of my feet, which is a good thing to, for stabilization, but I feel like I'm a, just a little bit more stable right now, perhaps, perhaps you do too. Okay. All right, let's go into, Okay, I've got a message. Oh, I see, I got it. Okay, <clears throat> so let me go back into screen share. <clears throat> and oh, time's going on, I wanted more time. Okay, so we're gonna go uh, into weightedness and side to side, into side to side balance. And so I'm gonna leave this screen on while we no, I, I will. I, I, I have a, a copy of it. I'll just uh, tell you what it is. Um, because uh, we're going to do some side to side balance. Side to side balance is very, very important uh, for um, side to side balance is very important when we walk forward or backward. Well, usually we're walking forward, but some movements are backward. The ability for us to go forward or backward depends on side to side balance as well. So now maybe you could, so I, my feet are showing, that's good. So we're gonna do some leaning. We're gonna start with our feet centered and it doesn't matter which way you go, I'm gonna to go to my right first. So I'm gonna to lean to my right, both feet are staying on the ground and I'm coming back to center. And now I'm gonna to lean to my left, stay within your comfort zone and I'm gonna come back to center. Notice which journey is easier, more, no, more natural. It's probably the way you go further. I go further to my right, back to center, then over to my left. I can go to my left. I'm getting a little better, but it's not quite as natural. It's not as long a journey. And so just doing some leaning, you're getting an idea of your more, your, the side you're more habituated to leaning into and I'm, my habitual side is my right. Now we're gonna go into the next exercise, which is um, uh, the uh, hip hiking, lateral bending, weight support. That's actually it, what's happened, it happens in walking. So 
what's going to happen is when we walk, there's a period of time where we have no weight on one leg. So all the weight is going to the other leg. And so here's what happens in that function. I'm gonna to go to my right first. It's up to you. But two things have to happen. I'm going to lean, I'm going to lean into my right leg and two things happen. As I let the, your feet stay on the ground, your, my right hip comes up, my left knee bends. And so I have a high hip and a low hip and I'm coming back to neutral. Now I'm gonna to go to the other side. I'm going to take my weight to the left. And as I, as I bend my right knee, my left hip comes up. So I have a high hip and a low hip. And there's a phase of walking in which this happens. Come back to neutral. This is a, a movement exercise you want to practice. Lean your weight to one side. Now notice when you lean your weight to one side, your whole body weight shifts over to that weighted leg. That hip comes up, your knee has to bend because you can't, with this is your short, this is, this is your quote short leg. Your long leg with the hip down can't go below the surface of the earth. So your knee has to bend. Come back to center. Shift your weight, bend your opposite knee, feel your, uh, uh, your weighted leg, the, the weight of your body will shift over that leg and it should. That hip comes up, the other hip comes down. This is a weight shift. Now you don't wanna over tuck or over arch. So if you're a person that over arches, you might find yourself over arching. If you're a person that tucks, you might find yourself tucking. You want your tailbone down, your sacrum to drop. You want to stay as lateral as possible. We're going to take this into walking, just a, a little bit into walking. So what happens is I take a step forward. I take the weight onto that leg. There's a slight C curve in my body. That's my high hip. That's my low hip. My back leg is bent. I bring this leg forward. Can you bring the screen down a little bit? And as I take my weight forward, the weight comes on to, maybe even a little more, the weight comes on to, <clears throat> I'm now my left leg, my right knee is bent and behind me. Sorry, the light isn't that good. I'm trying to describe what's happening. And my left hip comes up, my right hip comes down. I'll go the opposite way. So you see from the back. I take a step forward, I bring my weight onto my right leg, my right hip is high, my left hip is low, behind me the knee is bent. I take a step, I bring my weight now onto the left, I'm a little laterally flexed to the left, my left hip is high, my right hip is low, my right knee is bent. This is a movement, thank you, that was great. This is a movement exercise you definitely want to practice. And it will also tell you if you have coordination and strength, or maybe you're very hesitant to let your full weight come into one side. And you may need to, um, like in the our cat stretch in the side flexion, you may need to practice. I'm gonna bring, I feel like I'm not in the light. Okay, let's do that. Um, you, you want to practice this because it will also build up the, your muscles like the gluteus medius muscle, the glute, the, many gluteal muscles are participating, but your abductors and your adductors on the inside, I can show a picture of that, um, have to be, I have to be able to, uh, work. Let me, let me come. Well, first of all, I can show this picture. In this picture, you can see um, she's brought her, lay, her weight into this leg. This hip is high. This hip is low. Her knee bends. She's just waiting around, but you can clearly see the weightedness. And you can see how she's brought her weight in a slight C curve over the weighted leg. 
Now, when we walk, this is from Hoppenfeld, uh, Physical Examination of the Spine and Extremities by Stanley Hoppenfeld, who's a surgeon. It's a great book, actually. Um, when we walk, our high hip, we have about a two inch differential from side to side as an average. Our high hip side is about an inch high, higher than neutral, and our back low hip side is about one inch lower than neutral. So we have this wave pattern of about two inch differential from hip to hip. And then what we we're gonna now practice standing, doing a little bit of balancing practice. And but before we do that, I just wanna show you. So in this hip hiking lateral flexion, our obliques are helping, are helping us at our waist. The gluteus medius muscle, major abductor that Thomas Hanna liked to um, talk about as it, with gluteus max and with gluteus minimus underneath gluteus medius. This is really allowing your weight to come into that leg and that hip abducts, it goes out. And there's a balance between your abductors and your adductors. And you see in this runner, nice, nice illustration of that. Here's her high hip, here's where her weight is. Her weight has come over her weight, her body weight has come over her weighted leg. You can see her C curve. You can see her low hip and this is her knee bent behind her. We're going to practice just a little bit balancing on one foot. And uh, let, me, let me come out of screen share. And I don't know, it's going to get dark again, I think. Um, but again, want to see my whole my feet if possible. And this is something that a little more on my feet. Yeah, that's good. Uh, um, this is something I need to practice. I've got good dynamic balance, but I don't have very good static balance. They're both important. So for we're gonna, what we're gonna do is practice standing on one foot. So what we wanna do is bring our weight into one side, let that hip get high, let the other hip get low, let your hip abduct, let it come out and find your comfort. You can adjust a little bit. And when you start feeling comfortable, you wanna start seeing what it takes to balance on one leg. It would be great to have a lot more time. We'll go side to side a little bit. I'm going to let the weight come into my weighted leg. I'm going to lift my other leg. I'm going to come back down and center. I want to go back and forth. And I want to see what am I doing on my easier side, on my side that likes to take the weight, on the side that feels more balanced to me. What am I doing? Maybe it's something I'm doing in my head and neck or my rib cage in my feet that I can figure out what I'm doing on my easier side. That, and my, my left side is my less sure side. And I decided to let, I decided to let my left hip abduct just a little more and that's kind of helping me. I'm trying to figure out what it is when I come into the right that feels more natural to me and more stabilizing to me. And I feel a comfort. I feel a comfort in this area on the right that I don't yet quite feel the same way on the left. So I go by going back and forth, I'm trying to figure out how I can increase my ability to stand on one leg. And there's many versions. You can use your arms, different kinds of things. Um, right now, at least that's introducing that to you. Static, static um, balance 
on one leg can be very helpful to increase your ability, your stability system, so you don't feel as frightened that you're going to fall or that if you start to fall, <clears throat> you'll catch yourself. Okay. Oh, time's going on. I want to, I, well, what, what I don't finish this <clears throat> in this class, we'll come back to in the next class. Let me go back into screen share. And I just, in a couple, a couple of classes ago, some of you may remember, I <clears throat> talked about mobility through the pubic joints to each hemipelvis and down through the feet. So here's our, here's our pelvis, here's our sacrum, here's our sacroiliac joint. But here's our, here's, this is a, a disc, it's called the pubic symphysis. Here's a disc and right here is a joint and right here is a joint. So this, from this joint all the way through this hemipelvis, and then at, from this joint all the way through this hemipelvis, and I like this picture because the disc is removed. So here's a whole hemipelvis and a leg even though this is not a voluntary joint, there is a lot of movement and mobility in both of these joints. So people are always talking about the sacroiliac joint and the sacroiliac joint is very important. A lot of people have pain and discomfort in their sacroiliac joints and often, maybe not always, often the key is to increase our awareness and sense of mobility in our pubic joints to each hemipelvis. So what we're going to do is we're going to, um, um, I'm gonna to try to find where I have this, um, right here. And we're going to um, internally sense our pubic joint mobility um, as we move. And I will illustrate this and maybe you can come along. So just remember, there's a lot of movement between these joints. And so as we do the following movements together, maybe you can get a sense of freedom in that area. Okay, now maybe pull this back again. Okay, so you can, you can palpate yourself if you want, you don't have to, uh, it's up to you. Uh, but you can also just think. So you might want to find your pubic bone. And on each, the, right in the middle is the disc. And on each side, you have this joint. And one of the movements I like to do and visualize the mobility right into this area. I wonder if this light could be shined on me more. Maybe you could see if you could position that. I like to think about the freedom in this whole hemipelvis down this leg, and now the freedom of this whole hemipelvis down this leg by just going back and forth, acknowledging this pubic joint, these two pubic joints to each hemipelvis and that freedom. Uh, we can do it with hip hiking, which we just did where we we brought our weight to one side, we bent the other knee. This pubic joint is now higher, this pubic joint is lower. And I can do that to the other side. This pubic joint is now higher, this hemipelvis is higher, this is lower, and that freedom of being able to switch back and forth, that's pubic joint freedom into each hemipelvis. You can think about you can think about walking and as you walk forward or backward, one hemipelvis and its leg is either going backward or forward. And think about freedom at these pubic joints, freedom at these pubic joints to, uh, to um, find more freedom within the whole pelvis. Okay. Okay, we're almost at time for class. So 
So I just want to say, I'll, I'm going to pick up a little bit of information uh, in our next class that we didn't get to, but I do want to um, go back to screen share. And I may even use this. I did not get to Perry personal space. I will do that next time. Uh, but I do want to just share this uh, momentarily, and I'll probably get back to it next time in my next class as well. And just say that walking uses all parts of the motor system. It may use all parts of the brain, but in terms of the motor system, it uses all parts. It, it Walking uses our motor and sensory cortex and via pendiculation, which we've done and explained many times in class, allows voluntary cortical movement to reset the resting tonus of the muscles. This means chronically contracted and tense muscles can decontract and become longer, more elastic, stronger, and more relaxed. You must move slowly and pay attention to your sensations to give your motor sensory cortex time to adjust and correct your movement patterns. Quicker movements do not challenge habitual tension. Quicker movements revert to the cerebellum, which is unconscious. To refresh and relearn movement patterns, you must use your motor cortex. And we now know our motor cortex also needs some time so that the, the stability system can be organized. Our limbic system is involved. The limbic system includes our psycho-emotional and perceptual systems, how we feel about ourselves, what our mood is, what our emotions are, what our self-talk is. All of that has an impact on our motor systems and, and how we walk and, and how we move. Our cerebellum, very important part of the motor system that deals with learned motor programs. It's also involved in coordination and balance. Walking, we don't think, most of the time we don't think when we walk. Walking is very much cerebellar. It also uses some brainstem reflexes, but it's very cerebellar. The brainstem is what controls reflexes such as the writing reflexes. Every movement, all voluntary movement involves some reflex, some cerebellum, some limbic. It just, they're, they're, it's not, these systems aren't isolated, but we can become more voluntary. We can become less voluntary and more autonomic. Um, we can come, become more reflexive in uh, situations of danger. We just automatically remove our hand from a hot stove or get out of the way of a car rushing at us. And then a very important part of our motor system is our spinal cord. It's called the final common pathway because all nerves uh, go uh, and neurons go from the brain down the spinal cord and out to our muscles and glands or feedback from muscles and glands come into the spinal cord and then up into the brain. Spinal cord is more and more research is being done on the spinal cord. It holds many secrets still, but it sets up the agonist antagonist function, the uh, muscle, the um, the complementary opposite muscle when muscle contracts. The opposite muscle has to decontract and lengthen in relationship to the agonist muscle. The spinal cord also contains our central pattern generators, which are biological neural circuits that produce rhythmic outputs in the absence of rhythmic input. They are the source of the tightly coupled patterns of neural activity that drive rhythmic and stereotyped motor behaviors like walking, swimming, breathing or chewing. And that's from Wikipedia. More and more is being discovered about our central pattern generators. And uh, one of the things that's being used so much in rehab uh, programs these days, and I'll go back and we'll end with this picture, is that um, elders, people in homes, people with Parkinson's, people in stroke recovery, all kinds of uh, rehabilitation programs are using music because music generates rhythms and it just makes you want to get up and move. You can have 
elders that hardly move are very, very sedentary. And you put on music, the music of their time when they were teens and in their 20s, and you put on their music, they start getting up and they start moving and they start dancing and they put a smile on their face. So rhythm is very, very important um, in many activities we do, including everybody I think knows what it feels like. Periodically you go out, you take a walk, you're unencumbered, you're breathing air, and you're just letting yourself move and you form this nice, wonderful walking rhythm. So our, our message for today is to, yes, we want to upgrade uh, certain skills so that we, we walk better, but we also want to go out, take a walk, and really enjoy ourselves. Thank you very much. I will come out of screen share. This is going to end our class today. I will stay over and um, we can have some discussion. And I will review some aspects of today's class in our next class, which I haven't put together yet, so I don't quite know all the themes that will happen in the next class, but I do want to cover a few more themes that have to do with um, healthy gait and walking and cover a few more concepts and I'll combine it with then some, some other material, possibly, uh, probably on the floor, working a little bit more with our stability mobility systems and how we can apply that in our daily cat routine. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'm going to stop our...